Hi, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you as well. Cool. All right. So let's just get started. And then uh, as people pop in and out, that's cool. Um, for those of you listening right now, we are going to have a question period at the end. So stay tuned um, for a kind of a bit better conversation between me, Liz, and the actual audience, which is you guys. Um, yeah, so I'm your host. Uh, my name's Erin, Queen Erin, if you will. <laughs> and on behalf of Queen Wellness, I'd like to welcome everyone here. Um, so starting with this masterclass, you'll, my hope is that you'll begin to become a wilder, more intuitive version of yourself. And that's exactly what Queen Wellness does. So this video with Liz Smalley is part of an online education series called Inspiring Insights. And basically we're focused on rewilding women, getting them to realign with them, with their feminine energies through education, nutrition, uh, movement and mindfulness. And hopefully in the long run, help you as women run just as authentically as you do efficiently. So drop a little heart below if you are uh, watching. Happy to have you here and for everyone watching the replay, so, so happy to have you here as well and definitely feeling your energies. So um, today I'm going to bring a very special guest into the spotlight, um, basically to help everyone understand the effects of the nervous system and basically how we go through and understand trauma in our bodies and in our minds. Um, the effect that trauma has on the nervous system and, and just how we can actually down-regulate it. And so I really like Liz's approach to, to trauma because she speaks of it from kind of like a color zone perspective. And that really, when I first chatted with her, um, really resonated with me because I, I practice Reiki, I'm kind of into more of the like colors and healing and mindfulness. And um, it really resonated with me on a level that I think a lot of other people um, in the Queen Wellness uh, space uh, in our audience can also resonate with. So Liz, I'm so happy to have you here and I'm excited to bring everyone's awareness to the color zones of our nervous system and how we can kind of relax into that green zone, which Liz will mention, so that we can live a, a healthier life. So thanks Liz for being here. Uh, let me just say a few more words. I know you kind of gave me your your background. So uh, yeah, um, psychologist Liz Smalley uh, is actually our down under queen. She's coming to us all the way today from Perth, Australia. So happy to have you, Liz. Um, Liz holds an honors and a master's degree in psychology. She's a registered practicing psychologist. Uh, she has published research as well. And so her most recent groundbreaking breaking research um, discover that over 30% of mothers of children with autism have post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, a PTSD, due to the challenging behaviors of their child. So this is very close to Liz's heart, as she is the mother of an adult son who has autism and an intellectual disability. And she's been passionate about reaching out to, the, to her following of autistic moms to help uh, them understand and overcome some of their common struggles that they face. Uh, of course, using candid examples from her own experience. And I know you just wrote a book about that, Liz, as well. And uh, not only does Liz work with moms of children with autism, but she's been working with clients using their own body to recognize and to heal trauma. And she's found in her own words that these clients seem to need busy work, busy mindfulness, uh, where they're doing something that actually seems to be soothing, uh, like tapping. And so we actually did a video, our last video uh, was on tapping. So check that out later. And as well as kind of occupying their mind so that they can relax their nervous system. And I so resonate with that. As a millennial, I think it's very, very difficult to kind of just calm our minds. And the best way that I've found is to actually do something else, whether it be with the fidget cube or fidget spinner or tapping, you know, anything that has something very physical to keep us grounded, to get us back into that root chakra. And um, yeah, I just, I love that aspect of what you teach to your own clients. And so Liz and I actually met 
through uh, my own book, A Drink Called Mindfulness, Liz emailed me and she had been um, recommending it to her own clients. And her feedback from her clients has been great from that book, A Drink Called Mindfulness. So I'm so happy, Liz, that you uh, connected with me. And yeah, and let's talk a little bit about um, the colors of the nervous system and kind of how you came uh, about all of that and using that metaphor to kind of really get uh, more in touch with people's nervous systems. Yes. Well, so good to be with you, Erin. It's uh, eight thirty in the morning here, and it's a beautiful <laughs> spring day. You're probably heading into autumn, but um, everything's exactly. bursting into flowers. And it's um, it's a beautiful day here, clear blue sky. So, um, I guess the first thing to say is with the colours of the nervous system, uh, this um, concept is based on the research of Stephen Porges. And so if you wanted to Google that to, you know, go a bit deeper with the research, it's Stephen Porges, and it's called the polyvagal theory. So really what that means, poly means, you know, several, and vagal is the nervous system, and theory is what we made up about it. So it's polyvagal theory. And that's been only around for probably about, 30 years, but it's really just started to gain some, you know, real traction probably in the last 10 years and it's sort of really exploding now. I think it's more relevant than ever as we become more and more stressed and just generally piped up all the time. You know, what do we do to relax? And, you know, as an older person, um, I didn't grow up with the internet. You know, Facebook, Facebook wasn't, wasn't invented. invented. If you wanted if you to want call your friends, you would have to ask your mum to use the phone to ring your friend. And they'd probably say, no, that's going to cost money. But now it's free to call everybody. And you're just accessible. You know, you've got Facebook, all the social media um, going on. So it's much harder to have those quiet moments. And, you know, when I was growing up, the TV would actually go off at 10 o'clock at night. Um, mm. But now TV's on 24 hours a day. There's, you know, so many avenues for stimulation, which is great. But if we're accessing all the stimulation all the time, then we're overstimulating our nervous system and we don't get the opportunity to actually down regulate and all down regulate means is just basically calm down <laughs> calm your nervous system down so with the colors of the nervous system i sort of like to think of it as being like a ladder really so the bottom zone is green and that's nice and calm and the way to remember that is just imagine yourself in a forest it's green it's calm you know, it's a nice place to be. The next zone is the red zone. So when we get activated or triggered or in psychology land, um, we would use the word aroused, but that always sounds like you're talking about sex. So I just go with triggered. <laughs> <laughs> triggered, stimulated, yeah. Yeah, so that could just be me like having a Freudian moment, but I just like to use a different word for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> That's yeah, amazing. So we'll just stay focused on that. Yeah. yeah, so okay, so we have the green system kind of like our most relaxed state, and then from there you have um, the red, right? So the red is yeah. more. Um, what would you call it? This is like kind of like ramping up. Yes, yeah. okay, fight or flight. So that's when we go into the fight flight. So we might get triggered by something and then we'll go into the fight flight zone. Sometimes when the trauma is so intense, um, you can then go from the red zone, fight flight, up into the blue zone and that's freeze and that's not that hard to remember because usually when you see a picture of an iceberg it's blue so in the mm. freeze zone and this is where you basically shut down and sometimes in that zone you can't even talk um, you just can't find the words and it's almost like playing dead to survive 
and sometimes we can switch very quickly between these zones. So another concept I'll just introduce here is also the window of tolerance. Mm. And it has similar colours. So as we're like, as our green zone, if we're at the top of our green zone, we're very close to the red zone when we're hyped up all the time. It's not going to take much to push us over because our, our little window of what we can tolerate just, you know, shrinks. And so it's not going to take much to activate us over into the red zone. So I guess in an example, you might find if you, you know, if you're sharing a house with someone or your partner, um, they might just do the smallest thing. Um, and if you like most couples, what you actually fight about is nothing, but um, <laughs> It might be the smallest thing like, um, I don't know, let's go with the toothpaste tube. And then you'll just absolutely go off in a disproportionate way, say stupid things, because when you're in the red zone, the front part of your brain that makes good decisions actually switches off. So you have no brains, you're upset and you're saying and doing really stupid things. Afterwards, when you calm down, you can be like, I don't even know why I said that. That was really stupid. And then you feel embarrassed. So you might not apologise because you feel too stupid. <laughs> um, so it's... <laughs> feel that with the toothpaste tube. I feel it. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes you can escalate that yourself. So when you're feeling, you know, agitated and you're in the red zone, um, you might say to your partner, for example, you know, the toothpaste is driving me nuts. And they'll go, right, because you, you've activated them. So they've bumped into the and red they've zone. they've got no brains working. They'll go, right, I see your toothpaste and I raise you undies behind the door. And they go, right. I see your toothpaste, I see your undies and I raise you the dishes. And before you know it, you have this massive, ridiculous argument. Nobody's talking any sense. It just never ends. And you just kind of, you don't resolve it when you're in that state. So it's very important to be able to calm back down. And I realise this is a bit sexist, but it's based on research that women can calm a lot quicker than men, but men actually need 20 minutes. So if you've activated your male partner and they've got upset and they say, uh, I'm going down the shed for a while or to my man cave, um, you really need to let them go. Don't go, you know, you come back here. We haven't finished this yet. Don't walk off when I'm talking to you. Um, that's probably the worst thing you can do because they're still in the red zone. Even if you've come back to the kind of the green zone, you've mm. got to allow for other people to calm down because our behaviour activates the people around us as well. Yes, you've mentioned something very, very useful. And this is not just about relationships either, right? It's it's to do with, you know, your colleagues, your coworkers, um, customers, clients that are mad, you know, and that's a good, it's really good. I didn't realise that, that like 20 minute period for men um, was more substantial, you know, and so women, I wonder what in the research is, is there any research indicating how long it takes women to, to transfer out of that red zone or is it variable? So a lot, lot quicker than um, men. And the way that you can measure that is really by just, checking in with your heartbeat. So you can, you know, check your heartbeat here. You can look on your fancy watch. Or sometimes when you're really upset, you can actually hear or feel your own heart pounding in your chest. I guess I can reiterate what she was just discussing. So Stephen Porges is um, really well known for his, like, pretty recent research on um, the polyvagal theory. And this is a really, really interesting theory that um, basically states that, so you have the fight or flight mechanism, right? When you go through a stressor, you 
so you either fight or you flight. But now um, with the polyvagal theory, there's also another uh, realm to that. There is the freeze state. And if you look at animals, um, they kind of have this state, you know, so say a squirrel when they're just crossing the road and you're about to like, you know, you're slowing down your car, and you're trying to figure out what's happening. They actually freeze first, right? And then they'll make the decision to move or run or stay or whatever. And so there's that this whole theory that the vagus nerve actually controls a lot more than we think uh, within the autonomic nervous system. And so there's another aspect of, of either the fight in us when we're stressed out or the run in us, the flight in us, there's actually that freeze state as well. And it's a really interesting theory. So look him up, Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S. And so what Liz was discussing was that there are zones to kind of go along with this theory that the green zone is actually like your relaxation state and then as you kind of climb the ladder up to fight or flight, you go into red and then blue, which is freeze. So sure. yeah, the green state, um, the red state and the blue state. And um, I, I guess we, yeah, so you were talking about measuring that uh, through heart rate, which is a really easy way to do that. And what kind of stimulated that for me was thinking that uh, heart rate variability, which is a really good way of a lot of people in the exercise physiology world, which is kind of the, the world where my background stems from, um, a lot of personal trainers and, and physiologists use heart rate variability as a way to uh, see how well your system's working. And so that's interesting that I guess the variability level of women, women's heart rate is actually better uh, in the research than men. And uh, with that, in that research, there's also the kind of thinking that the heart rate variability of someone, when it's actually more variable, is better because you're able to kind of like go up and then come back down, go up and then come back down kind of thing. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit of a mm -hmm. interesting similarity there. Yeah, definitely. And I think you were also um, saying about um, the these zones don't just apply to relationships with partners. Um, they also apply with your relationships with people at work, your clients. Um, and I guess in my case, um, with being the parent of a child with autism, it um, whether you have a, a child with a disability or not, as a parent, your kids can also activate you when they do that thing that you've asked them not to do a hundred times, whether they've got a disability or not, they can really do your head in. And exactly. You can start to, it can be quite triggering and you can find yourself ramping up into the red zone. And then again, your brain has switched off. So you might say some really stupid and hurtful things to your child that when you were calm, you actually wouldn't dream of saying those things and then you have the feelings of guilt and shame that go with that and that's one of the important associations that once you go up into the red zone or even the blue zone um, there's an element of shame attached to that because you're doing behaviors that you wouldn't do when you were calm and um, then after that after the you know unfortunate event um, you've got to recover but then the other aspect of that is you also need to repair. You need to repair your relationships. So you need to downregulate, calm your body. Um, and then when you're in that calm state, you'll be able to recognize the dumb things that you did. Um, and then you may need to do some repair. <laughs> I, yes, I so agree with you there. I, it's funny that you say that because it's, you know, we've all been through that sort of argument where we've said all those things that we shouldn't have said, and it all just kind of blurted out all of a sudden, you know, and it's not until minutes, if not hours later, that we discover that we shouldn't have said those things, you know, or, or wow, I really didn't mean what I 
what I said back there. Like, why did I say that? And it's exactly as you said, it's because that frontal lobe, kind of that decision making piece mm -hmm. of our brain just like shuts off completely when that nervous system is too engaged, too stimulated. And yeah, I, I yeah, I, <laughs> I'm just thinking of a few times in my own life, you know, where that kind of, I, I want to say where that threat has come up, you know, where, mm -hmm. where I've been so overstimulated or so aroused, you know, by kind of a threat that I thought was uh, imminent, very imminent in, in my life or in an argument or, you know, someone standing in front of me, even just based on their facial expression, you know, I, I see that as a trigger or like a threat. And so, yeah, we start you know, we don't even know that we're in these zones and we start to go on and on and on. And and then all of a sudden, hours later, you're like, oh my God, I really, <laughs> I was a mean, horrible person back there and I didn't mean to be that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think um, Sesame Street have a really good video where um, the monster comes out and <laughs> It, it's another the monster part of yourself comes mm. out and it's like how do you calm that monster down again exactly. and it's interesting yeah. what you're saying about um when you're in that zone and you can perceive a threat it's interesting that um when we're in the calm zone somebody can say to us um could you please wash your bowl and we'd be like yeah sure i'm sorry i should have washed it but when we're activated, our hearing changes. So somebody may say, please wash your bowl in the same voice, same tone, but we're going to interpret it as a threat. So we might hear it as, why didn't you wash your effing bowl? Um, but that wasn't what they said, but that's what we heard. Mm -hmm. So then we kick off with the, into the red zone because we were already there. So this is why it's so important because you can end up having a lot of conflict that is actually mis just a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation. There's no malice there, but by the time you get through saying dumb things with no brains, then you really have a conflict because you might have brought up, you know, I see you and I raise you. And then before you know it, the stakes get really high. Mm -hmm. And it was only about, could you please wash your bowl? Mm -hmm. So you can see that by understanding the zones in the nervous system, that it's really helpful to avoid conflict and to take a pause and just think, if you're feeling threatened, that might feel like, <gasps> or your heart might start pounding, or you might get sweaty or... You might feel a bit shaky when you're up in that red zone. All, you know, it's, it's different for different people, but there are those common feelings. Like you might feel like you have butterflies, your palms might be sweaty, your heart might be pounding because you're perceiving a threat, which might be, oh, I'm going to have conflict with someone. And, you know, most people don't like conflict and conflict represents a threat. So when we've misunderstood a very simple comment, hey, please wash your bowl, um, and we've perceived a conflict, then we're going to come out with fight flight because we're thinking there's a threat. And it can lead us to escalating very simple situations. If we were calm, they wouldn't happen. So when we're activated all the time, like at the very top of the green zone, very easily bumped over into the red zone, um, it can really add a great deal of stress to our life and actually keep us up in that red zone. So then while we're still in the red zone, someone else will come along and say, why didn't you wash your cup? And then we can kick off with that and you can end up fighting all day. Then the whole world is against oh, you, right? Oh. When it rains, it pours. Exactly. That's exactly it. And it's so true when you when you perceive someone to say something um, in a manner that, you know, maybe, maybe, yeah, they could have said it a little bit better, but they didn't mean any malice behind it. And right. it, it's really up to us. I think that it's, which, you know, removes the onus uh, from the other person at that point. Mm -hmm. It's, it then becomes our own responsibility 
to say, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I am actually not in a state where I can understand exactly what they're saying. And mm -hmm. that in itself can actually remove a lot of the anger and irritability and frustration out of the picture just by noticing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're in that state, right? When oftentimes, yeah. and especially, I feel like, you know, as a teenager, I felt this kind of like the world was out to get me, you know, a little bit. And you might move out of that as you age in life. I, I feel like I'm a little bit more out of that now. But even still, there are people, when they ask me simple questions, I automatically have this like response to that. And, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if I'm always like in that response when they're around or if they're like, their tone, you know, maybe triggers me or um, like I said before, their facial expression or something, but it really removes that context out of the picture and just looks at it more like mindfulness in a more objective manner, you know, and, and you can look yeah. at the statement that they said as just words, you know, no intonation behind it, no expression behind it, just words. And then you can understand it from, from, also a non-objective objective perspective yeah and i think it's a good point that you're making there too so another aspect of this is what we would call co-regulation mm. so let's flip this around and say um you, you know somebody comes to you and they're angry and you're not angry yet but you're about to be because they're going to say something really stupid, <laughs> you know, like, why didn't you put the stapler back? You're always taking the stapler. Um, and so they are angry and we were calm. So when we're calm, um, we can think, oh, um, they look like they're upset. Um, so what we can do is co-regulate. So if we can try and stay calm, and I think like you're saying, interpret it there's no malice there or look even if there is that person's mad about the stapler they're genuinely mad and they're mad at you so that can be quite triggering but if we can stay calm we can use the mirror neurons in our brain and our breathing if we just keep breathing steadily they will be able to down regulate using our nervous system which is just mind-blowing that if we can stay calm and you can do this like with kids there's a lot of talk about you know parents co-regulating with kids you can co-regulate with your partner with your co-workers even with your boss if you have to by staying calm staying in the green zone you can help the other person to calm down because if you kick off as well and blow up the whole thing's going to escalate. But if you can calm down and just make an observation, it seems like you're really upset about that and just stay calm and quiet. Don't, don't throw petrol or fuel on the fire. Just stay calm <laughs> if you can. And it takes practice because they're, they're you know, having a go at you and angry with you. Um, but if you can stay calm, you can help them to calm. And if you keep breathing steadily, keep your heart rate down their nervous system with um, neuroception they will pick up on that and calm and the other thing you can do if you're in a closer relationship and you're sort of like living with someone is um, having a code word so you don't try and make up a code when everybody's mad and upset so when everybody's calm there might need to be um, it can feel a bit wooden the first time you do it and a bit contrived, but it's like, um, we need to stop this now because I'm getting upset and I can't talk to you about this now. So for some people, like say when you're right up in the blue zone and you can't even get your words out, you might just have a hand signal, you know, stop. Or you might just have a word. It might be sausage or, you know, prawn or, you know, some ridiculous word that's just like, well, we've got a, we've got a safety button here. I, I need to stop because this is going to escalate and I can't calm myself at the moment. So your body's going to pick up danger, danger, threat. In that moment, sometimes you need to just go, I, I need to stop now because I'm going to do something regrettable or say something that I'm going to feel ashamed about in, you know, half an hour. 
and allow each other to be able to walk away and actually get yourselves back in the green zone, which as you were saying, is each individual person's responsibility. So the person that mad about the stapler, that's actually on them, but how we respond to that, that's on us. Mm. Yes, very well put, Liz. I also, uh, so, and anyone who's in kind of a customer facing role or management role can definitely feel this and resonate with it, that, you know, when you get that angry customer on the other line, and I, I've had so much of this after kind of post COVID quarantine, where a lot of our, a lot of customers patience is just a lot less. And Maybe that's because, like you were saying earlier, maybe the window of tolerance, like it's not that their abilities to be calm is any less. It's just that there's a lot more stress in their window. And so there's, there's less capacity for them to perform in a way that's a little bit more calm. But I, I found, and maybe this may applies to empaths a lot as well, is that what we don't know if we're feeling the thing that we're feeling, we don't know if it's ours, right? And so a lot of the time when someone gets mad at you, we just take it in, we take it in, we take it in. Instead, and I've found this to be a really good boundary setting exercise, is to agree with them. And that yeah. almost immediately kind of like stops the argument because that's exactly what they're arguing about, right? That they want some sort of resistance there, that they see resistance. So when mm -hmm. I'm on the phone and the customer is yelling and I say, oh my God, it sounds like that can make the more, like your morning, the worst morning ever. I'm so sorry. And mm. instantly, this is almost a lesson, you know, empathetic communication, but just to instantly diffuse a situation, right? And those mm -hmm. are practice techniques. It's not something that comes naturally to a lot of people. If anything, it's the opposite. We want exactly to shout back and say the exact same thing back and there's also some research in that that's you know saying that or, or responding back in a if someone's shouting at you responding back shouting but saying words that are like really calming <laughs> can also be helpful yeah. um so yeah i'm wondering about that and like just how it all applies to kind of De like diffusing and kind of like coming back down the ladder into the green state because sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't that kind of agreeing mm. aspect of, mm. of things in the communication setting I think you make a really good point there because um, what I was thinking as you were talking with you had the customer call up they're upset sometimes with anger anger is considered what we call a secondary emotion so anger is not actually the problem the problem is the thing underneath the anger mm -hmm. so that could be sadness loneliness frustration um wanting to be heard um somebody to say like you were um using the example hey that must have made your day absolutely awful i'm so sorry to hear that your day has been awful, how can I help you today to make your day better? Because what the person wants, they might be ringing up um, about something that's frustrating, like maybe they've ordered something, it hasn't arrived, it's not your fault because you're not in dispatch or whatever, like there's a right. whole chain right. of things, but you're the person they've got on the phone and they're having a big old vent um, you know, and they may have had a fight with their partner that morning, their cat may have gone to the vet, you know, and their kid just got expelled from school, you know. <laughs> and I guess one saying that I like very much, um, particularly I think it's very relevant for empaths as well, that over-identify with other people's feelings, it's like not everything's about you. <laughs> you know that person's yelling at you on the phone that's got nothing to do with you they just need somewhere to to vent so by empathizing with them and thinking what is it that they really want they're angry that's their behavior what is it that they're craving underneath that they're not getting and it might just be you know with their customer service 
I want to be heard. I want to be understood. I want someone to acknowledge and validate that my parcel should have arrived. And they know that it's not your fault. You don't even have the parcel. But they want someone to say, I understand. I care about how you feel. And I'm going to do my best to fix it. And I'm going to validate your feelings. It's okay to be upset that we said you'd have it in a week and it's been three weeks. And this is the fifth time you've rang up and nobody's done anything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what they really want is validation and to be heard so when we're in a calm state we can start to think at a deeper level when we have somebody that we're engaged with who's upset in the red zone possibly angry what is it that they really want and need in that moment and if we're in the green zone and we train ourselves to stay in the green zone because not everything's about us then we can help them and co-regulate them even over the phone. Yes, I love that, Liz. Thank you so much for that. I, I'm wondering, as you were saying that, it kind of um, made me fast forward to the freeze part of that kind of um, central nervous system response and really, you, okay, now we're gone beyond the anger, right? We're gone beyond right. the perceived threat. We're like, holy beep, I don't know what to do about the situation. And all of a sudden you just freeze. And so mm -hmm. what are some symptoms that maybe we can be more uh, aware of that, that will maybe tell us that we're in that zone? Well, I think probably the one word that describes that zone very well, apart from freeze, is the word collapse. Mm. So if you imagine you've baked a cake and you took it out of, it was rising nicely, you took it out of the oven and it sunk in the middle, that's the exactly massive <laughs> fail. That's the feeling of just collapsing. It's almost like imploding into yourself. You don't want to talk to anyone. You don't want to engage. And sometimes in that, in that zone, um, you can dissociate. So dissociate means you kind of feel like you're observing yourself from outside. Um, you kind of separate a little bit from reality. You're not crazy. Um, or there's nothing wrong with you. You don't have a mental illness. But there's that moment where you kind of just don't want to be there and you kind of mentally go somewhere else. And that's a protective um, uh, reaction um, to keep you safe. And it may be a reaction from, say, childhood, where perhaps if you'd been under in threatening situations as a child... Um, or as an adult, if you think about domestic violence and that sort of thing, where the safest thing you can do is play dead. Don't get up, don't fight back, um, play dead. And, you know, imagine that you're somewhere else just to survive. In that zone, physiologically, our heart rate will slow to less than the green zone. So in the green zone, you've got a nice steady heart rate. Red zone, thumping out of your chest. Blue zone, really, really low. And sometimes if you would, you know, check your heart rate monitor, you might go, well, my heart rate's like 52 or something. Um, wow, I must be really calm. But if your normal resting heart rate is like 65, you're not calm. You're actually shutting down. So that's another good descriptive word of shutting down, where you just go into yourself. Um, and in that, in that way, uh, when you're in that state, you can't really do your breathing and calm yourself because you don't have the mental capacity to do it. So sometimes it is just curling up and waiting for it to pass. If you have a partner or a pet you might just curl up with them and co-regulate with them. Mm. So it's really useful. Um, I, I don't know a lot about cats, but I, I have dogs. You can actually co-regulate with your pet. So when you're in that maybe shutdown zone, you might have your pet next to you or your partner. 
you can just put your hand on them. You can feel their calming heart rate and your body will start to co-regulate and calm. And actually, if you stare into your dog's beautiful brown eyes, um, you will release oxytocin with them, which is kind of a feel-good feeling. And that bonding chemical, that will also help you to down-regulate. So if you don't have a human around, you can co-regulate with a pet. If you don't have a pet um, or a human, you can actually have a teddy bear. I recommend for adult clients as well, have you got a teddy bear or have you got like a, a, a little blankie or something that represents safety that you can hang on to? You might just hug a cushion or you might be hugging your pillow, something like that that helps you to feel safe and it represents safety. So even as an adult, you can hug a teddy if that's something that you're going to feel safe doing. And I think it's quite a shame that we grow up and think, you know, games, running around, being silly and hugging your teddy and playing are just for kids. I think they're for humans. Very well said. Very well said. I agree with you. I think that there's a lot of, um, like you said before, shame as well. And that kind of aspect of like, oh, you're showing emotion or are you wanting to self-soothe? You are not, this is not the way that an adult does it kind of thing. And if that's not the way, what is the way? You know, that's, we have to kind of return to those techniques because they helped us so much as children, right? And even just mm. hugging your parents or hugging someone that you know and love and, you know, feel supported from and like mm. you said, even just hugging like a pillow really helps or your favorite, you know, animal or pet or toy. Like I so agree with that. And it's funny also that you say about the heart rate, because I think oftentimes, especially people who have maybe dissociated before or have gone through trauma, don't know if they're not getting help or if they haven't, you know, been been helped by any psychotherapist or anybody they often mistake that freeze response going about in their day-to-day -day, um after the the trigger as a calm response and so mm -hmm. that's really important to note um that that just because your heart rate is less and maybe you're not sweating as much and not wanting to run away um it's not actually that you're back in the green zone. It, it might be the even further down kind of thing. That's right, in the blue zone. And you can wonder why, well, my heart rate's calm. Um, I'm not sweating. Why do I still feel awful? I feel like in that blue zone, you can feel blue or depressed and be like, well, why do I still feel so awful? I, I feel depressed. I feel sad. I feel hopeless I feel emptiness and thinking oh but I'm calm and like you say you've gone actually beyond the red zone um, you're not in the green zone and that's why you still feel all those negative unpleasant feelings of hopelessness depression sadness um, dissociated um, because it doesn't match up with well I'm calm I should be happy um, and happy is a bit of a strange word. I've kind of gone off happy and I go for contentment or satisfied mm. because what is happy? Um, so, in, you know, you're not actually in the green zone. You've actually gone into the blue zone, you know, beyond the red zone. And that's why your heart rate's low. You're not sweating, um, but you still feel, you still don't feel great. Yes. And, and with that, what can we say to our audience maybe that, you know, okay, so we have some things that they can be aware of, that their heart rate might be lower, that they're still feeling icky, but it's not quite the same as a, as a fight or flight response. Um, I, I'm thinking just from my own uh, days of, of teaching, like when I first started getting into mindfulness, um, progressive relaxation was was a really good way for me as an athlete when my body was kind of still in the in the stimulation but I needed to relax 
in my mind yeah. in my head you know um and i found that progressive relaxation was a really great way to do that I'm really just squeezing my muscles one mm. group at a time but symmetrically on my body and then eventually just starting to feel what it was like to feel the opposite of squeezing so it's like that mm. the tension and release technique that really helps you get back into your body mm. Yeah, that's a really useful one um, because I find that it's very helpful for for people to have something to do because I, I it might be partly cultural as well that we all feel like if you want to fix something, you've got to do something. Mm -hmm. So giving some actions and using the body to help down-regulate. So I do like progressive relaxation. I was thinking also when you're in the blue zone, you maybe don't have the mental capacity to um, go through your body and do the progressive relaxation. So even if you just squeeze one thing, you might just squeeze your hands. You might, you might do this. You might hug yourself. You might actually rock because rocking is very soothing. And I think it's got a bit of a bad reputation because, you know, sometimes people um, with autism rock and it's one of the like negative behaviours, but actually we rock babies. Why do we have rocking chairs? You know, because rocking is really soothing or going on a, go and sit on a swing. And, you know, just a reminder, grown-ups can swing as well. You don't have to be a kid to swing. So, you know, just swinging or rocking and the squeezing, even if all you can manage in the blue zone is to hug yourself or hug your teddy, hug your pillow, it's that pressure sensation that is really helpful. If you're at work, for example, and you want to do something discreet, so we're sort of also talking about calming, but now another concept is grounding. So when you've dissociated, you need to come back. So one of the ways you can do that is with pressure. But if you were sitting at your desk, for example, you can just push your heels into the floor. Nobody will ever know. Or you can squeeze your butt cheeks on your chair as long as you're not going, you know, <laughs> just do it discreetly, you know, like just, you know, squeeze some muscles on your your chair. I'd be careful with squeezing your fists if you're out in public because that, that looks quite aggressive. Mm -hmm. But under your desk, you might just be able to squeeze your hands. So a little bit of squeezing or the other thing you can do, you might have gone to the coffee room, you've put the coffee machine on, you can actually like press against the wall, like just press yourself against the wall or lean and Nobody will even know. You'll just look like you're leaning against the wall, but you might be putting a bit more pressure on or lean back against the wall. Or even in your chair, you can just sit back in your chair and just press your back into the chair and notice. So when you're grounding, it's about noticing. So you want to just press your back into the chair. Your co-workers just come up and gone off at you about the stapler. You're not going to jump up and shout at them. You're going to squeeze, hold the bottom of your chair. You're going to press back in your chair and you're going to press your heels into the floor and take a deep breath. <laughs> mm. And honestly, that is one of the best ways to do it. I, I know it, we kind of live in a society or culture that, you know, really makes us feel lesser than when we're not doing the normal right so if we're not going mm -hmm. out to lunch with our coworkers, if we're not um you know getting angry as well with our customer or you know with our clients and everything it, it's people see you as like other human you know like superhuman almost <laughs> and yeah. i mean why not why not get there why not get to that place and what you're saying is really really um demonstrates that humans you know it's okay to to go to all those zones and with mm -hmm. practice it's way more easier to what you call ground what you call um just be more mindful you know be more in the present and that is really what it's all about trying to get um deeper into states of consciousness 
so we can stay and remain in that green zone, right? Because that green zone is where our creativity lies, where our curiosity lies, where our innovation lies, you know, all those things. And when we're constantly stuck in the red or blue zones, we're not there. And we're not able to collaborate with other people as well either. Yeah, um, because the green zone is also called the social engagement system. Mm. So the bottom zone is social engagement. Um, the next zone is defensiveness. So that's how you get into arguments, by being defensive. So you want to come back into the social engagement zone, the green zone, where you can engage with others and you can engage with yourself by being creative, curious. Um, and I think some of those things have been assigned to, to children's qualities, to be curious, but we shouldn't ever lose our curiosity or our sense of wonder or, or joy. You know, when you just walk out your front door and you see a tree that's come into flower, you know, take delight in that. And I think this sort of leads us to, um, you're sort of alluding to the idea of being in the green zone. We want to practice calming, not just when we're upset. We want to practice calming when we're calm. Because this will make our window of tolerance bigger. So it's going to take a lot more for us to get into that red zone. So if we focus on our green zone, when we're calm, we do even more calming and mindfulness. It will make that window bigger and it will reduce our conflict and increase our creativity and all those green social engagement activities will be enhanced if we can make the green zone even better exactly yeah. wow that's i think that's a really great place to kind of conclude liz that's incredible i feel like we could talk about this this stuff for hours and it's true there's a lot more to kind of be discovered by by research but also by our audience and by our listeners and there's a lot of stuff that we didn't even talk about today so i'm I'm hopeful for another, maybe a, a part two of the colors of the nervous system. Um, anything you wanted to add? Um, how can the people kind of find you and, and follow your work and your research? So um, you can find me on my website. That's Sunshine Psychology. Um, the website name is feelhappynow.com dot au or you can find me on facebook or you can read my book that's called when autism is tearing you apart and you can find that on amazon but if you just google i'm not really too hard to find that's amazing liz thank you so much for sharing your insights um, I, I'm sure we have a lot more to talk about and I'm, I'm looking forward to another space and time when we can do this. But thank you again, Liz, so much for waking up early and uh, <laughs> starting your day off on a good note and uh, ending our day off here in uh, Toronto on a good note. So thanks again. And thanks for having me. It's been great talking with you again. Yeah, thank you so much. And for folks at home listening, if you did like this video, feel free to share it with anybody you like. Um, subscribe to the Queen Wellness YouTube channel. Uh, go ahead and like, give us the thumbs up if you're into this. And for any um, comments, concerns, or suggestions on further videos, please do give me a shout on Instagram. It's Queen Wellness on Instagram, spelled with a K. Uh, so it's K-W-E-E-N, wellness on Instagram. Thanks again, folks.